secret government uh, monopoly of the world. And um, I realized that all of these monopolies interacted and about the same group of elitists, the world order people, uh, were in each one. But I had not paid much attention to the medical profession. I thought, well, these are doctors who are uh, curing people. They work in the hospital long hours, you know, and they're probably a public asset. And um, I thought that simply because I hadn't had any contact with them, uh, fortunately for me. And uh, other people who have had contact with them uh, had a different view. Either they were furious or they were disgusted or they were dead. And uh, so this was the status of the people who employed the medical profession in the United States, the average American citizen. And um, uh, the doctors, uh, during this period, as part uh, of the drug trust and the medical monopoly, had had various uh, instruments furnished to them by the other monopolies. For instance, the, the oil monopoly of John D. Rockefeller at Standard Oil had gone into the petrochemical business, and through extensive research, they had uh, developed certain medications, which they called wonder drugs, and uh, the public, as they took these drugs, they would wonder what was going to happen to them. That's why they were wonder drugs. Others uh, were called miracle drugs. They were called miracle drugs because if you took them and you survived, it was really a miracle. So uh, this was the contribution of the monopolist to the uh, medical monopoly. And the only thing that these drugs had in common was that they were enormously expensive. Now, in contrast, most of nature's remedies are enormously inexpensive. They're available, they're abundant, they're cheap, which means that the medical monopoly did not want you to use any of these medications. They wanted uh, the greatest achievement of the uh, modern drug trust was the invention of the $1,000 pill. They have, uh, now they have, they have one pill which costs $1,000, which you use in cancer and various things. And uh, nature, unfortunately, has never learned how to make a $1,000 pill. So uh, obviously, nature is no good as far as the medical monopoly is concerned. Well, tell us a little bit, just before we get into that also, there's a difference between homeopathic medicine and allopathic, and that's part of what we're discussing also. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would, Eustace Mullen. Well, what you're talking about is a historic situation. In the 19th century, most Americans uh, thrived on what is called homeopathic medicine, which is mostly naturopathic remedies available through nature in abundance at low cost. Well, the medical monopoly, which was formed in 1847 as the American Medical Association, they didn't like this. They thought, how are uh, doctors going to get rich and how are we going to control the people through the medical monopoly when they can go to these homeopathic people and get these remedies at very low cost? So the first plank of the AMA was we will never allow any homeopathic physician to become a member of the AMA, and they never have. So, but the AMA was still in a minority. So around the turn of the century, John D. Rockefeller realized there were great potentialities of profit in the medical industry. And so uh, he took over the medical profession. Uh, now you say, how could anybody take over the medical profession? Well, first you have to have a lot of money, and second you have a lot of power. Well, he had both, and he did. So he revamped the entire medical system of treatment of the people of the United States, which had been homeopathic. He switched it over to allopathic medicine, which is a different type of practice originating in Germany. And the great attraction of allopathic medicine is it relies on uh, radical surgery. I mean, if you can't cure it, cut it off. And uh, uh, the heavy use of drugs, because when you're having your limbs cut off, you need a lot of drugs because it's uh, very disturbing, and uh, lengthy hospital stays, none of which fe are features of homeopathic medicine. It's entirely the reverse. So uh, by taking over the medical industry in 1910, uh, through studies which he made through the Carnegie Foundation, John D. Rockefeller emerged as the kingpin of the medical monopoly in the United States. And he now presided over an allopathic system of medicine controlled through every legislature by accreditation of hospitals, uh, uh, the control of physicians, control of medications, and which is essentially what we have today. 
So from 1910, when this change was effected, uh, right to the present day, the cost of health care has multiplied astronomically in the United States to the point where it is no longer uh, available to most American citizens. Uh, so how did they counteract this? When they got us to the point where the average working man could not afford hospital care or the allopathic system of treatment, uh, they set up an insurance industry, medical insurance. And uh, through this, they were able to spread out the costs among everybody. And, and uh, health insurance today is simply another tax on the American people. In fact, it functions through the Social Security system as a tax on the recipients of uh, Social Security. They say, well, now that you've reached uh, your senior citizen stank, uh, you have uh, Social Security coming in. So then they jerk back a good portion of it for, as Medicare costs, which they raise every year. And uh, so eventually, uh, probably, uh, Social Security and Medicare will be equal. So you'll get a church uh, check uh, every month, which will be zero, zero, zero. They say, well, here's your Social Security check, but we've deducted your Medicare uh, costs, and so now you get zero. And it's funneled into the Rockefeller-style monopoly, whoever is involved in it. Oh, all, of the, all of the money from the health industry goes into the medical monopoly and the drug trust. Interestingly enough, the Rockefellers control every uh, major drug company in the world. And now when I say control, I mean directly. They have, among the directors and officials of each of the 18 largest drug companies in the world, they have men from Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, from the Exxon uh, Oil Company, and so forth. So they're right there, the names. I have all their names in my book, Murder by Injection. And uh, with this kind of control <coughs> and the monopoly, they have been jacking up the health costs on the American people monthly, not yearly, but monthly. Mm -hmm. Well, at $666 billion last year, <clears throat> that was a lot of money for this country to spend on health. And, and we're spending twice what many of the free world countries are spending. Japan and Germany, we're almost spending twice. And you say that this is part of the monopoly, and that's part of the reason that we're spending so much? Well, uh, actually, the, we're not spending it. The money is being stolen. The Washington Post carried a story not long ago in which they pointed out that the hospitals and the AMA physicians, and I'm not talking about quacks or cranks or uh, fly-by-night people, I'm talking about the medical establishment is stealing directly $77 billion a year in health costs from the American people. And uh, does the Washington Post offer any solution to this? No, they say by 1995, uh, the amount of theft will be more than a hundred billion dollars a year, stolen directly, uh, plus all the other uh, money that they get. That's, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we're four trillion dollars in debt. That's part of it anyway. So let's talk about uh, the Hippocratic Oath, or maybe the Hypocrite's Oath, and Gallen and Dr. Robert Mendelson, but uh, what about the profits of cancer? Let's go into that, Eustace. How has cancer become profitable for people? Well, you see, the medical industry, just like any other industry, they go for the big ticket item, and cancer is a big ticket item. I think the average cost of treating cancer is $120,000. And uh, uh, the interesting thing about it is when you go to a doctor and he says, oh, you have cancer, and he says, I really can't do anything for you, but I'm going to give you a lot of treatment. It's going to cost you a lot of money and a lot of pain. Your hair is going to fall out. You're going to wish you were dead, and sooner or later you will be. But meanwhile, we'll get all your money. This is called cancer treatment in the United States. The, uh, but, uh, how did this start? How did this come about? We're, we're, let's talk about radium um, before, because I think radium was one of the first uh, cures, supposedly. Uh, who developed the radium treatments? And, and tell us a little bit about that, if you would, Eustace Mullins. Well, you know, there's a Frankenstein, a Dr. Frankenstein aspect to modern medicine. Uh, where you have all of these mysterious machines throwing out various uh, beams of light and uh, radiation and so forth. And uh, the person who's doing this, of course, is hopelessly insane. And uh, when you go into modern treatment, you, uh, you pretty much find that you're in a Frankenstein uh, environment. And you have to be pretty much insane <laughs> to <laughs> well, you, uh, participate. You wish you were insane because if you're still conscious, it's pretty hard to endure what they put you through. And uh, so, uh, modern cancer treatment originated uh, with a doctor from South Carolina named uh, Sims. And Dr. Sims uh, apparently was just a 
common run-of-the-mill sadist, and uh, he liked to operate on people not because he wanted to cure anything, but just to be cutting them up and, you know, having good, clean fun. And uh, <laughs> so the, the people in South Carolina, uh, after they got onto him, they wouldn't let him touch them anymore. So he was reduced. He had to go and buy a slave girl. This was before the Civil War. He had to buy a slave girl for $500 so that he could uh, cut her up. And then uh, the people in the area were so outraged by what he was doing that uh, they ran him out of town. So he went to New York, where his peculiarities would be less obvious. <laughs> and uh, he started a cancer hospital up there, and uh, which uh, was called Women's Hospital. And this was uh, uh, financed by a very wealthy lady named Melissa Phelps Dodge of the Phelps Dodge fortune, a great mining fortune. And uh, so he ran this hospital for a while. And again, the rumors started to uh, creep out that there was a lot of torture and sadism going on in this hospital. I mean, uh, you know, uh, he didn't give up all of his fun just because he went to New York. That's where you go to have fun. And so he was going great guns. And so everybody at the hospital rebelled and said, get rid of Dr. Sims or we aren't coming back here anymore. Well, his wealthy patron, you know, they don't like uh, for their, uh, their lackeys to be uh, criticized. So she ignored them all, and he continued. And uh, this hospital later became a memorial hospital. And then uh, it was uh, financed by uh, a relative of hers named James S. Douglas of the Phelps Dodge Mining Corporation. And uh, uh, he was called the Copper King. Well, in his mining interests in uh, Arizona, he had come across a lot of radium, uranium, which uh, he also mined. And, uh, he became fascinated with the possibilities of radium as a treatment of various diseases. So he experimented on his uh, wife and daughter until they both died of radium poisoning. And he continued to experiment on himself. And he also died of radium poisoning. And so Memorial Hospital then uh, uh, was continued. Uh, the fact that all these people had died didn't discourage the doctors at all. I mean, the fact that the treatment kills you uh, never has discouraged any doctor yet. And uh, in fact, they say, well, he got a lot of relief, didn't he? And so uh, then it became a slow, slow, it, from Memorial Hospital, the name changed to Sloan Kettering uh, after the, the great two uh, automobile manufacturers, Alfred P. Sloan of General Motors and Charles Kettering, who invented the uh, battery and uh, the electrical system of the automobile. And their fortune was funneled into this Memorial Sloan Kettering hospital, which became the center of cancer treatment of the entire world. I call it the Cancer Mausoleum there in New York City. And uh, it looks like an old Egyptian mausoleum. So uh, even though it had the names of Sloan Kettering on it, it was taken over entirely by the Rockefellers, Lawrence Rockefellers on the board, and uh, various of their people from Chase Manhattan Bank. When you read, and I have the list of uh, directors of Sloan Kettering in uh, my book, uh, each one of them has a direct Rockefeller connection. All the cancer treatment in the United States stems from the work done at Sloan Kettering. And uh, it's, it's still principally based on uh, radiation and on chem chemotherapy and radical surgery. And in fact, they had one treatment there which consisted of chopping the whole lower part of the body off uh, on the theory that that would stop cancer. Well, everyone they tried this treatment on died, so <coughs> you, even well, they stop cancer, right? Well, they say the operation was successful, <laughs> but the patient died. That's, that's, uh, right. that's modern medicine. <laughs> and uh, like they say, you lose a few and you win a few. Right. Uh, so uh, anyway, Sloan Kettering is the great cancer hospital. And the fact that it goes back to this lunatic named Dr. Sims uh, doesn't bother them one bit. Uh, so well, tell us a little bit about the difference today. What is chemotherapy? And can chemotherapy <clears throat> be helpful under certain circumstances? Well, the theory behind all cancer treatment of the medical monopoly and the drug trust is that you destroy the offending cell. A cancer cell is a cell which supposedly has run amok and uh, begins to grow wildly throughout the body and just shuts off uh, normal cells and kills them, and that's how you die of cancer. Well, uh, this approach, which is strictly allopathic, says you've got to destroy that offending cell through first through radiation, and you burn it out, which means you burn up everything around it also, but uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't discourage anybody. 
And secondly, through chemotherapy, you find some very strong chemical which uh, can be injected into the body. It'll go right to the offending cell and uh, destroy it. And of course, it, it also destroys everything around it. Now, the, the homeopathic cure for cancer is restore the immune system. In other words, the body can control cancer through its own uh, native resources, its inner resources of uh, isolating uh, the offending cells and then destroying them or letting them starve. But uh, actually, all allopathic remedies for cancer actually encourage the cancer. Uh, for instance, they always make exploratory surgery. Well, in cancer, once you cut anywhere in the flesh, the cancer will go throughout the entire body. The cancer cells just say, boy, what an opportunity. We can go everywhere now through this surgery, and so they do. So that's why they say in cancer treatment, oh, they opened him up and looked at him and said it's hopeless and sewed him back up. And that's, that's exactly what happens, because once you cut into a cancer patient, he's gone anyway. So uh, one of the great causes of the spread of cancer in the United States is our exposure to carcinogenic uh, systems, uh, mainly chemicals and pollutions in the air. So the allopathic system, the Rockefeller system of controlling cancer, once you have uh, introduced carcinogenic uh, substances into the system and you begin to have cancer, then their solution is to introduce even more carcinogenic substances into the system, which they call chemotherapy. And of course, the patients die there too. And uh, the great uh, uh, illustration of the success of uh, chemotherapy was a very famous senator, Hubert Humphrey, who had been vice president and he developed bladder cancer. And uh, so they treated him for about a year and a half and they said, what a great success uh, it is that we're having with Senator Humphrey with chemotherapy. So then chemo uh, Hubert Humphrey finally uh, was interviewed and he said, uh, chemotherapy is living death and he died. So that's the only real <laughs> illustration they ever had of the success of chemotherapy. And uh, he denounced it, uh, he had breath enough to denounce it before he died because he had really been through misery like no human being should ever be subjected to. But not only do you have carcinogenic substances but, and pollution, but you also, a lot of the spread of cancer is due to the fluoridation of the water in our public supplies, which of course was done through the Chase Manhattan Bank and the Alco Aluminum Trust. And uh, not many Americans realize that we, uh, the water systems of our major cities were fluoridated in the 1950s because the uh, head of the public health service uh, was Oscar Ewing, a former uh, chairman of the Democratic National Commission, who was then giving a high paying job in Washington of the Federal Security Agency, under which the uh, Department of Health and Human Services functioned. And he had been a former attorney for the Aluminum Corporation of America, and they had this problem of disposing of the sodium fluoride, a byproduct of the manufacture of aluminum. It was very expensive. It was probably the most dangerous toxic substance known in the United States. And so uh, they said, we've got to dispose of this somehow less expensively. And someone came up with the notion, and I call it a notion because there's never been any evidence for it, that uh, if you uh, put sodium fluoride in the water and a child under the age of eight drank it, he would never have any cavities. So uh, we got to do anything to help the little children. So they fluoridated all of the uh, water of our cities. But then a congressman named Adolph Miller went on the floor of Congress March 27, 1952, and he gave a different story. He said, there are no studies which show that sodium fluoride does anything for anybody. But he said, I did find that Oscar Ewing received a $775,000 bribe from the Aluminum Corporation of America to to enforce sodium fluoride uh, fluoridation of water in every major city in the United States. So you're drinking fluoridated water not because it helps your children's tooth, teeth, but because a, a federal official took a $775,000 bribe. This is the way things are done in Washington. Uh, well, medicine is big business, right? Medicine is big business, and it pays well if you're in the right position <coughs> at the right time. So Oscar Ewing took his bribe. He went to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and he developed one of the biggest office complexes in the South, uh, which is now filled with government offices since he was head of the Democratic National Commission. It's called the uh, Triangle Research Corporation. 
and it made him and his family wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. That $775,000 was parlayed into a $50 million research center, owned mm. entirely by the recipient of this bribe. So he got the research center and we got the fluoridation. And the fluoridated water, one of the effects of this on the human system is it damages the immune system. <clears throat> In other words, your immune system, if you have been drinking fluoridated water over a period of time, two years or 10 years or so what, uh, it loses its effectiveness. So it's no longer able to combat illnesses, particularly pernicious diseases uh, and ailments like cancer. <clears throat> and AIDS also uh, stems directly from uh, the fluoridated water. Most of your AIDS victims came from large cities which had been the first to fluoridate their water. So, Because uh, of the immune system, it made it more the immune susceptible? System, more susceptible to AIDS. Uh, now, the AIDS virus supposedly attacks the immune system, but the immune system has already been under attack for a long time from the person who's been drinking fluoridated water. So, uh, really, what has happened when you get HIV virus is that it attacks an already weakened immune system. And uh, so this is the real explanation of AIDS, and not because a little green monkey supposedly uh, got together with a woman in the heart of Africa in some village, and suddenly everybody came down with AIDS all over the world. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, the drug trust figures, tell them anything, they'll swallow it, uh, because we've got the media and we, we tell them this. Well, they've been, we've been swallowing enough drugs for a long time. <laughs> well, we have been, indeed, yes. Yeah, it's like we have been perpetually drugged over the last 50 years regardless. But the Drug Trust and the Rockefellers, their treatment for cancer is called the cut, slash, and burn technique of curing. And of course, uh, it's sure death. Uh, it's a slow death. I mean, it's like the old Indians, you know, when they would uh, capture you. Uh, on the frontier in the early days of this country and they would stake you out and torture you for four or five days or as long as you can last. Well, the doctors do the same thing uh, when they diagnose cancer. That means you're in for a, a really long period of torture until you finally succumb. What about the Cancer Society itself? I mean, people give a lot of money to the Cancer Society. Is that beneficial for them to do so? Well, uh, they have these annual cancer drives in which uh, the people in all the small towns of America uh, are forced to go out and uh, collect money for the American Cancer Society, and I describe that as the, the little people collecting money for the big rich. Mm -hmm. uh, American Cancer Society is a big rich uh, organization, and uh, if you remember that it was founded at the Union League Club in New York City, the wealthiest club in New York, by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. See, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. was a great philanthropist, and he said, we're going to do something about cancer, so I am founding and I'm putting up the money for the American Cancer Society. See, the Rockefeller uh, family has had a long-term commitment to cancer. See, the founder of the dynasty, old John D.'s father, William Rockefeller, uh, was a carnival sideshow barker who sold bottles of mineral oil for $5 a piece and he advertised himself as the great cancer specialist. And so he sold these all up and down uh, through Pennsylvania and Ohio uh, when he wasn't running from the law because he also was a very famous horse thief and he also had 18 warrants out against him for rape. So just a very colorful character. <laughs> and so John D. Rockefeller, his son, was just the opposite because he was so horrified by his father, uh, his father's escapades that he led a very, uh, bourgeois life, very quiet, very good family life, and uh, devoted himself to making money. But he found out that at least his father had one asset, and that was that making money through cancer cures was a surefire thing. So the Rockefeller family today is the dynasty which is behind all the cancer treatment in the United States through the Sloan Kettering Cancer Mausoleum of New York City. Well, what would you do, Eustace, if one of your very, very close uh, relatives or friends had cancer. Would you just, uh, where do you go? Do you go to the hospital? Do you have a checkup or do you eat apricot juice or what? Well, I have a relative who has cancer, has had it for five years. And unfortunately, he went the whole route. Uh, first, he had 25 radiation treatments, then he had 34 um, chemotherapy treatments, and, uh, you know, and the cancer spread to his bones because none of these things do anything to stop the cancer. It causes you a lot of misery, but it doesn't really affect the cancer. So uh, 
he's had quite a difficult time of it. Do you mean to tell me that chemotherapy really doesn't help, or can it help, or can't, I mean, is there any way? I mean, what about radical, what about surgery? And you're saying that there's no way. Cancer, I mean, if you cut the area that's cancerous out, uh, doesn't it have a, a, a stopping action? Or? Well, you'll see feature stories in the press uh, constantly where some individual somewhere, they found somebody who did have cancer and who had this treatment, and so now they proudly announce the cancer is in total remission. In other words, there is no cancer there. And uh, unfortunately, this is what the medical monopoly itself calls anecdotal medicine. In other words, you, t you t tell a story about some something that happened to your grandfather or your nephew or somebody, and that uh, it was, uh, the cancer went into remission. But there's absolutely no scientific basis for any of these claims. And um, the story that the medical monopoly puts out is this person was diagnosed as having cancer and they went to the hospital and they had radiation or chemotherapy and the cancer went into remission and they've lived ever, happily ever after. But there again, you have absolutely no way of evaluating uh, this hype which is in the media. I want to personally thank one of America's number one patriots, Mr. Eustace Mullins, for his courage in being able to author a book of such significance in the face of the dynasties, the syndicates, and the anti-middle class establishment. Eustace, I thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you, and I want you back on the Bobby Lee Show soon. Thank you, Bobby Lee. I'll look forward to it.